My mind is a raging torrent, flooded with rivulets of thought, cascading into a waterfall of creative alternatives. I will be dealing in this lecture with what I call common campus curses. <laughs> Questions asked by the pseudo-intellectuals, problems generated by the antagonistic professor, and generally the things which bug Christians who are trying to do an effective job of evangelizing for Christ. Now there are three types of apologetics. There is the high-level apologetic that almost nobody pays any serious attention to on the level of the layman simply because they don't understand the vocabulary. Then there is pop apologetics where you try and take the serious material and bring it down to the average person's level so they will know what's going on and how they can give an answer. And then there's slop apologetics. That's the person who doesn't pay any attention to what's said but grabs a snatch of this and a snatch of that and runs in and thinks they have all the answers and gets creamed. <laughs> we want to avoid slop apologetics and we're not going to go into the serious upper strata because I don't think we're going to communicate. Donald Barnhouse used to say, get the hay down out of the loft onto the barn floor where the cows can get at it. <laughs> and that's really the task of the church, to feed and to build up the body of Christ. So what we're going to do is discuss some of the things that most currently and consistently bug Christians. These are the topics I hope to be able to get through. The problem of miracles, wish fulfillment, which is God exists because I wish him to. Infinite regression, Supposing there is such a thing as cause and effect. You keep going back and back and back and back and back and you arrive at God and you keep right on going. Because after all, if you're going to regress to God, who made God? And then uh, the universe and the existence of God. How do we know that there really is any evidence that there is such a thing as a divine mind? And can we adduce such evidence? And how would we set it forth reasonably? And then the riddle of relativism. The people who are always saying, well, it really doesn't make any difference what religion you belong to or what ethical or moral commitment you have. The only important thing is that you understand that all culture makes religion relative. So that what's true for us is not true for the aborigine. What's true for the aborigine isn't true for the Zulu. What isn't true for the Zulu might be true for the Amazon Indian. So culture determines the relevancy of religious values. Let's not get hung up on absolutes. There are no such things as real absolutes or eternal verities. And then the circular reasoning argument that uh, you Christians are always talking about the Bible as the word of God. And then to prove it, you quote the Bible to substantiate itself. That's circular reasoning. Why don't you get off that and try and find a better argument? These are some of the things I'd like to cover. And then we'll have a question and answer period at the end, hopefully. So if anything germinates in your fertile minds, uh, you will have an opportunity to ask a few questions at that time. The Lord willing and my vocal cords still remaining. Let's deal with the problem of miracles, because this is something which bugs an awful lot of people. Uh, for some good reading on the subject, I recommend uh, C.S. Lewis's book on miracles, which does a nice job of good pop apologetics in explaining the subject. And there are also some other books that have been written on the subject which are meaningful. InterVarsity Fellowship has put out some good stuff on miracles. And uh, there are also some good popular treatments that are pretty well available in campus bookstores. But let's get down to the nitty-gritty of the problem of miracles. The big bugaboo in the problem of miracles is a philosopher named David Hume. And every time that you go into a university campus or take a course in philosophy, eventually you're going to run into David Hume, one of the British empiricists. Now, Dr. Hume set up a canon of evidences against the idea of miracles. And his basic argument was this. A miracle is said to be an intervention into natural law or a reversal of natural law by a divine being, ergo God. But as we examine the phenomena of the world, we notice that there is an un uninterrupted chain of phenomena without this so-called supernatural disruption 
All of our experience tells us, for instance, that corpses once thoroughly dead are not resuscitated, that water will not support the weight of a human body. All of our experience tells us that you cannot feed 5,000 or 4,000 people with a minimal amount of bread and fishes, and that the miracles so-called in the Bible do not fit into the experience that man is capable of recording, that we can see and examine. So since we have no recapitulation of that, since we have no evidence that this happens to us, we are living in a closed system. And this natural order, to all intents and purposes, is not disrupted. Since a miracle is the disruption of the natural order, there are no miracles. And then Hume went on to give evidences further beyond this particular idea as to why he didn't believe it was possible. Now, there are two quick refutations of Dr. Hume that will save you reading a lot of material. I suggest that you think about them. If you're recording them, you don't have a problem. But if you're trying to write them down, then write them carefully because they must be stated accurately. First of all, Hume's argument rests upon a simple logical fallacy. He never, ever, he never, ever refuted miracles. He never, ever proved that they couldn't happen. All he did was to define them out of existence. Defining something out of existence is not the same as proving that it didn't happen. And here's how he did it. He began with the premise, we live in a closed, ordered structure. Natural law does not alter. A miracle is a break in natural law, therefore there can be no miracles. He didn't refute a miracle. He simply said, because natural law exists, there can be no miracle. So he defined them out of existence. Now, how do you really refute Hume? Simply. You do it scientifically, first of all. In 1926, Heisenberg enunciated the principle of uncertainty in the nucleus of the atom. What does that mean? It means, well, this is very impressive when you tell it scientifically. <laughs> it means that at no given moment in the nuclei of an atom is it possible to account for the presence of a given electron. This is Heisenberg's principle of uncertainty. In the basic structure of atomic matter as we understand it, atomic materials as we understand it, it is impossible to determine the position of a given electron. Heisenberg therefore concluded, since the atom is the basic structure of all creation, we do not live in a closed system, we live in an open system. And a miracle could happen by Heisenberg's principle, because at any time, the system could alter. Hume's idea that we live in a closed system that never changes is scientifically refuted in 1926. The scientists have done us a great honor. They have demonstrated that Dr. Hume's argument is not scientifically valid anymore. If the basic stuff of the universe can change and is uncertain in its principles of operation, so are the so-called immutable laws of nature. They can change too. Now you have a good scientific principle to use to demonstrate that a miracle is possible on the principle of uncertainty. And it's a good scientific thing to quote. Makes sense. Also, please point out that Dr. Hume did not refute miracles. He simply defined them out of existence. And you don't refute by definitions. You simply have to come up with evidence. He had no evidence whatsoever. Now, I think that there are other things that be, could be quoted on the subject of the miraculous. And we could go into great detail demonstrating them. But David Hume is the fountainhead of about 80% of all criticism of miracles. And if you read his writings, he's always hammering away on those points. So hammer back <laughs> on the same two points. And it really shakes people up to find out that Hume's position is really not as solid as they thought it was. Now, Hume also had some other positions on cause and effect, and he had some positions beyond that in other areas, which we don't have time to go into in depth. I'd like to be able to when I taught apologetics 
consistently in, in college and in seminary. I used to take a whole semester on Feuerbach, Hume, and Bertrand Russell to show how their influences penetrated all thinking on a pop level. Nobody understands them up here, but they've been popularized down here. Now people understand them. And we don't have time to do that right now. Keep those two things in mind on miracles, particularly. A miracle is a supernatural intervention that can take place based on Heisenberg's principle of uncertainty. And you can't get rid of miracles by simply defining them out of existence. You have to refute them by proving they cannot occur. Hume did never, accom never did accomplish that. In fact, there is a quotation from David Hume that is quite stunning when you read it. He said, in observing the phenomena of nature, one cannot be insensible to the idea of an intelligent creator. This is the man who is supposed to have been anti-God, but who said that the evidence of nature itself, inductively and logically, led one to the sensible conclusion that there was somebody who was running the show. I think that's worth noting that Hume was not, as is openly declared, an atheist. He was a skeptic. That's somebody who doesn't know and is busily engaged in chasing his tail trying to find out. <laughs> Second thing we run up against quite frequently originated with Ludwig Feuerbach, the brilliant German philosopher and theologian who utterly destroyed the philosophy of Hegel. Feuerbach came to the conclusion in a book, The Essence of Christianity, that man visualized his own wishes of God and immortality, projected them beyond his body, and then worshipped them. And that God is nothing more than your desire and my desire to survive and believe in someone or something that can guarantee that survival. I've condensed 340 pages of Feuerbach into one paragraph so we can have a Reader's Digest condensation. This is the theory of wish fulfillment. Now understand it very well. I wish to exist. I wish to be immortal. I wish for God to guarantee this. Therefore, because I wish it to be true, I project that wish and worship it. And that becomes, in effect, the explanation for the idea of God. Now, of course, he does it very elaborately and develops it chapter after chapter, and it's a devastating book. Unless you really understand Feuerbach, you can get yourself not only tripped up, but pretty badly blooded, because he was a tremendous intellect. But, as so often happens with the philosophers, the next school of philosophers that come along take care of the problem for the Christians. They refute them. But most Christians don't know who refuted Ludwig Feuerbach. The idea of wish fulfillment, which is all over your campuses under different labels, recognize it? That idea has been refuted by another German theologian, Eduard von Hartmann. You probably never heard him. The name is a tongue twister. He's a real buddy of ours, so you ought to get to know Ed. Edvard von Hartmann. He is called the philosopher of pessimism. He examined Feuerbach's Essence of Christianity and then wrote his own book, the essence of which is the following statement. Professor Feuerbach's entire thesis rests upon a logical fallacy. He maintains that the desire to believe and the wish to believe is proof that there is no God. Says von Hartmann, let us demonstrate by analogy how fallacious this is. I am in bed suffering a night of agonizing pain. I wish and desire earnestly that dawn will come. The fact that I desire the dawn to come is not proof that dawn will not come. Ah, see? Think that one through. The fact that I desire dawn to come is not to be adduced as proof that dawn will never come. <laughs> now you think for a second. This was the magnificent 
of the sword. He cut the whole bottom right out from under the foundation. I am wishing for immortality and for God. So I desire it earnestly and I wish very hard for it. Feuerbach says, the fact that you are wishing for it is proof that God doesn't exist. Von Hartmann turns around and says, oh yeah? Let's take it analogically. I'm suffering a night of pain and I'm wishing for dawn so that my pain will stop. The fact that I desire the dawn to come cannot be adduced as proof that dawn won't arrive. You'd be an idiot if you believe that. And he just, right out from the un underneath, Feuerbach. Feuerbach's philosophy never recovered from von Hartmann's critique. <laughs> but most Christians don't even know who the two of them are and the first one gives us lots of trouble and the second one solves the problem. Now I realize you're going to have to think that one through for a while. <laughs> Recognize there may be a little problem and try and communicate that. But nevertheless, it's a good argument. If you want a further exposition of this argument, I suggest you get hold of C.H. McIntosh's book entitled Types of Theological Systems. Types of Theological Systems, where he discusses Feuerbach, von Hartmann, and a group of other theologians and philosophers, and shows you just how it's possible to refute some of these so-called irrefutable things. That's one of them. Thirdly, infinite regression. You start talking about God and you say, well, we've got to begin someplace. So, someone or something must have made us because we're finite. So let's regress back to the universe had to be made by something and then we regress back from the universe to a force outside the universe that made it and we arrive, as the argument generally goes, at God. So say the philosophers, you can't reason this way because you fall into the fallacy of infinite regression. The moment you get back to God, what is to stop you from saying, who made him? And then, who made, who made God? And who made, who made God? And regress, 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 regress. And where do you end up? Total frustration. All right, is there a quick answer for the argument of infinite regression? Yes, there is. You may care to make a note of it. <coughs> the argument runs this way. When a person is talking to you and says, you can't argue me back to God. Who made God? That's Bertrand Russell's great argument in his book, why I am not a Christian. Incidentally, if you read the book carefully, you'll find out that Bertie is terrified of hell. He mentions it no less than 18 times in the book. And that's because his relatives were Christians and they brought him up to believe in Jesus Christ and it never shook. Tried all his life to get away from him. He never got away. The last interview Bertrand Russell ever gave on television, he was asked the question, what would you like to be remembered for most? your scientific and mathematical accomplishments, your philosophical accomplishments, or your humanitarian efforts. He said, I would like to be remembered, if at all, for the fact that I have tried to serve and to love my fellow man. The greatest of all maxims is thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. <laughs> this is Bertrand Russell at 94. He spent his whole life trying to shake it, and he's back to it. And then the interrogator said to him, uh, Dr. Russell, or Lord Russell, he said, that we know that you're an, an atheist and you don't believe in God. And Russell said, no, that's not true. He said, I am an agnostic. I do not know if God exists. I never said he didn't exist. I only said I didn't know. And then the fellow said to him, well, um, supposing you are wrong and he does exist, what would you claim as justification for your life? Russell sat in the chair, looked at the TV camera, and said, I suppose the fact that I have tried to fulfill the golden rule. So his justification at the end was what? He was going to be justified by the fact that he did listen to Jesus Christ. That to me is very significant about Bertrand Russell. Russell is the source of this criticism. Christianity cannot stand and I won't be a Christian because I regress back to God and then beyond God who made him. So he gives up his faith. All right, now, how do you answer something like that quickly? Do it this way. Say to the person who gives you this argument, okay, 
Let's assume that we have regressed from mankind through creation and the universe and we are now back at God. This person says, all right. Who made God? And you say, well, let's assume somebody did make him. Okay? All right. So what does it prove? It proves that we are not responsible to God's maker. We are responsible to ours. Think, think now. We are not responsible to God's maker. We are responsible to our maker. Why? Because if we appear before his throne and we give him the argument, I didn't believe in you because I can regress beyond you to somebody who made you, God could answer, it doesn't make any difference if somebody made me. The only thing that makes any difference is I made you. <laughs> Now I want to know what you did with what I told you to do. Very reminiscent of the hippies on trial in Chicago who were violently complaining to the judge that they, the judge had no authority to do anything to them. They were free moral agents. And the judge answered them by saying, I may not be the Supreme Court of the United States, but I do have enough authority to take care of you. Thirty days. <laughs> and he put him in. There's a lesson to be learned from that. That judge was not the Supreme Court. That judge simply was an intermediary. But the intermediary had the power to judge those people. All right, let's use the philosophical argument that there is a finite God. That some force greater than God made him. The argument is totally irrelevant. The argument has no bearing and no weight the moment you grant it, because we are going to have to answer to the God that made our universe and that made us. And so the person who wants to regress beyond him has no reason to regress any further. Why? Because he's the one that's responsible for us, and he's the one that's going to demand of us why we didn't obey him. So give them their finite God, and then end right there with the finite God demands you to give an account to him. What are you going to say? You have cut the infinite regression argument right out. And you're at a God who has the power to send you to hell. Because you wouldn't believe in him. So then it leaves you in the nasty position of having to explain your relationship to him. <laughs> and while they're mumbling around with that one, which is a difficult one to refute, it originated with Edgar Sheffield Brightman, uh, the great philosopher at Boston University, who did believe in a finite God. But when he was pressed on the subject, he came up with a very nasty argument. The argument being, so what? <laughs> it's exactly what it ends up at. God says, so what? Somebody made me, I made you. Buster, answer to me. <laughs> That's the end of it. Where are you going to go from there? Anything beyond that is irrelevant. That's a reasonable argument. It's a rough translation of Brightman, who was a very, elo uh, very eloquent man. <laughs> <laughs> But we're doing pop apologetics, so it's a rough translation. <laughs> now the people who talk about there really isn't any empirical or scientific evidence for the existence of God at all. Everything that exists only exists on the laws of statistical probabilities. Therefore, why in the world should we even think of the name God? Doesn't make any sense. I was going to appear one night on a television program, and um, I thought it'd be a good idea before I went if I talked to a truly good scientist, happens to be Earl U. Bell, who's uh, uh, the uh, top scientist in New York at that time for the uh, Herald Tribune, before it went out of business, then he went to uh, uh, ABC. And U. Uh, Bell is a very gifted man. I went over to see him because I had some documents I wanted him to look at, and I wanted to ask him a question. We got over there, and I said, I've got to meet some people tonight on a program, and they don't believe in the existence of a created universe. He said, well... I said, well, I don't know what you believe, but I want to ask you a few questions. Go ahead. I said, what theory of the universe do you believe in? The Big Bang? That everything just boomed out of grandma and granddaddy hydrogen item, Adam? <laughs> he said, uh, well, he said, that has some merit. I said, what about the steady state theory? He said, I sort of lean to that, that the universe is uh, expanding and contracting and uh, exchanging energy and matter. He said, I lean toward that, Hoyle theory. I said, uh, how about the universe was created? 
said, well, he said, that's unscientific. He said, we're talking outside the realm of science. That's metaphysics. I said, all right. You've answered my question pretty well. I said, now I'm going to ask you another one. I said, there are only four possible logical... There are only four logical possibilities for the existence of the universe. He said, there are? I said, yes, there are. The first is that the universe emerged spontaneously out of nothing. And he just laughed. He said, oh, he said, well, it's ridiculous. He says, one of the basic laws of physics, from nothing, nothing comes. I said, right, you're right, I agree with you. Didn't happen that way. I said, the second is that the universe doesn't exist. It's an illusion in our minds, and we only think it's there. <laughs> so he looked at me for a second. He said, are you for real? <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm just asking. I said, that's a possible explanation. He says, it's ridiculous. He said, we can predict with pinpoint accuracy the movement of heavenly bodies. Look at Halley's Comet. We know it's going to come back unless it rammed into something. He said, it's going to come back 75 years after 1910. 1985, back we come. He said, we can tell eclipses, we can foretell this. He went into great detail. I said, all right, so predictability indicates that it's not illusory. Absolutely. I said, all right, the universe is not an illusion. I said, um, we know it's not an illusion. We know it didn't emerge spontaneously out of nothing. Uh, it must have always been there. So he looked at me for a moment, sort of fishy-eyed. <laughs> He said, well, that depends. And I said, well, do you believe it was always there? He said, well, Hoyle's theory says it was always there. I said, do you believe it was always there? He said, well, I have some reservations about Hoyle's theory. I said, well, let me ask you a little further on the point. Because you have to dialogue this way. Because if you ever affirm anything with a scientist, he automatically takes the reverse position. You should always begin with interrogation, and then you're safe, because they don't know what you believe, so you won't have an argument right on the, the beginning of the discussion. And I said, let me ask you one more. I said, uh, do you believe in the second law of thermodynamics? He said, um, yeah. I said, it holds that the universe is losing energy at a maximum rate, so great that it can no longer be replenished, therefore, According to the Einsteinian theory of relativity, the end of the universe is maximum entropy or ab absolute zero. You believe that? He said, well, Einstein did. I said, do you believe it? He said, well, the second law has been called into question. I said, has it been disproved? He said, no. I said, then the second law stands today. All the evidence is there. Yeah. The end of the universe is maximum entropy. I said, then it wasn't eternal. Because if it was eternal, it would be refiring itself at the same energy peak that it had when it was created, or when it was at its beginning. And it's not. So I said, there's only one other possibility, isn't there, Dr. Ubel? Something or someone outside this dimension of reality exercised a force infinitely greater than the universe at its maximum moment and brought it into existence. He said, that's metaphysics. I said, give me an alternative. I'm ready and willing. He said, well, there isn't a scientific alternative. I said, you either got eternal hydrogen atoms or you have an eternal God. Which do you prefer? He said, well, a scientist can never affirm God. That's faith. I said, you, you exercise faith every moment of your life. All of us do. Why not faith in that process of thought, too? He said, well, anyhow, he said, when you go on the program, he said, I think what you're saying will hold up. He said, but uh, find out what the man's scientific background is. So I went on the program, and I went through exactly the same steps that I went through with Dr. Ubel. And when I got to a crucial point on the program, one of the men who was on the panel said, and he slipped when he said it, he said, I believe that the universe came into existence. And I said, that's good. I believe that too. He said, but it came into existence not the way you and I think of something coming into existence. It just sort of happened. <laughs> and I said, it just sort of happened? 
I said, from what? He said, well, I don't know. He said, it, it just, it's there. <laughs> and I said, well, it's there, but how did it get there? He said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, but the fact, now listen to this, the fact that it's there is proof that that's the way it had to happen. <laughs> so help me. So help me. The fact that it's there, that's the way it's got to happen. I said, what a magnificent scientific explanation. <laughs> what you are saying in effect is, I don't know how the confounded thing got there, but however it got there, God didn't do it. He got very uptight. You can press cosmology to the end of the earth. You can back a scientist logically and theologically into a corner. You're going to end up with exactly the same thing. It's there. That's all that's necessary. So all I'm trying to demonstrate when you get into a discussion on the universe and the existence of God is you can't prove God's existence from the fact of the universe. What you can prove is the high probability of a force outside this dimension creating this universe, according to the second law of thermodynamics. And there you can rest your case and call that unknown substance X and then begin from X to demonstrate that there is order, that there are laws that there is predictability, and that these things come about not as a result of statistical probability, but they come about as a result of a continuous design. Now, how do I know that? They're going to ask you that question. How do you know it's by design and not by probability? Chance can create things. If you take a box of alphabets and just shake them all up and dump them out, eventually you will get A, B, C simply by the fact that chance and probability will produce this. What they do not tell you is that the same throw that produces ABC, the moment it is picked up, will scramble ABC, so that whatever chance creates, it instantaneously annihilates by the same principle of its creation. You can take the proverbial monkey and put him at his typewriter with an infinite band and have him whack away at it and he may come up with to be or not to be in maybe two or three hundred thousand years. But at the end it's going to be to be or not to be, that is the Verschwungen. <laughs> because the same law that got him to there is going to whack him up right down the line. So don't be hogtied by chance and probability. Remember this phrase, what chance creates, it almost instantaneously annihilates. So if we're here by chance, we should have long ago disappeared by the same probabilities. Now we come to evolution, or monkey town, USA. <laughs> we run into a lot of problems with the evolutionists because every time they want to solve the problem of life and ethics and morality, they have a simple solution. Evolution! All you have to do is ask them a question and they can't answer it philosophically and what do they say? Now, evolution explains the whole thing. Now, I'm going to give you a good analogy to use with the evolutionist. Shakes them up a little bit. Whatever shakes them up, worth using. I'm going to say to the evolutionist, listen, supposing we're standing outside General Motors assembly line in Detroit, you know that long line that produces cars, and we see a beautiful Eldorado Cadillac come out. And we lick our chops as it comes off the line. There it stands in all its pristine $9,000 glory. And I turn to you and I say, isn't it remarkable how that assembly line created that Eldorado? And you would look at me, I hope, and say, you're out of your wig. What do you mean the assembly line created it? The engineer designed it, and the assembly line put it together. No engineer, no Eldorado. Right? Right. You guys are standing at the end of the line, looking at the product of creation, and you are assuming that the mechanism which is producing change and the mechanism which is unfolding in front of us is the creator. By what law of logic does the process become the designer? Any more than the assembly line becomes the designer. It doesn't. If evolution exists at all, notice I use the if proposition with them, if evolution exists at all, 
It is not the cause, it is the effect of a cause designed by some intellect that fitted the mechanism together. So don't stand at the end of the assembly line at Homo sapien and say, well, here we are. Isn't it wonderful how the mechanism created us? The mechanism has no intelligence. The mechanism has no reason. The mechanism has no capacity to design. You don't seriously believe that Grandmommy and Granddaddy Protozoa got together in a pool of slime two or three hundred million years ago and decided they would erect the enormously complex DNA molecule, do you? Of course not. Nobody in their right mind believes that. Well, where did it come from? If, after all, we follow the evolutionary hypothesis to its logical conclusion, everything which now is initially existed in the basic structures. Otherwise, you couldn't have it now. Well, you mean to tell me the DNA and RNA and the structure of all these veritable forms of miraculous life creation began with protozoic structures? And that they contained all of this? If so, what are they doing with us still? Seems that they didn't make any progress with it. Something else changed. Now, this is a good approach to the evolutionist to get him at least to think for a moment. And then you want to give him the coup de grace. You say to him, you know that chart that Life magazine puts out about the Hall of Man, you know, how we began down here with the pool of slime and Grandmommy and Granddaddy and how everything whirled around and we moved up, you know, through the various types and then through the amphibians, the birds and everything. And finally we got to the caveman, you know, old humpback and slope jaw and the one with the receding forehead and, you know, the whole line, Eoanthropus, Pithecanthropus, Java, Heidelberg, Neanderthal, and then we got up to Cro-Magnon, and finally, here we are, Homo sapiens. You know, that whole chart goes all the way up, you know, Java, Peking, you know, Australopithecus, you remember all that. And the evolution says, oh yes, definitely, he'd be very impressed with your knowledge of this subject. <laughs> yes, yes, I, that's right, that's the chain of man, that's how we got here. It came all the way from the small one all the way up to the big one. Brilliant. Got a little problem. In 1957, Dr. Arthur Leakey, digging in Uvalde in Tanganyika, unearthed the skull of what he first thought was a perfect human being. The skull had almost the cranial capacity of Homo sapien. And he was elated. And Dr. Leakey was hailed in National Geographic and all the magazines until they dated it. The date of Homo habilius and Gingianthropus erectus, the two oldest, antedates every other one of the skeletons and looks the most like us. Now think for a minute. What is the one looking the most like us doing down there? Two million years ago, he should be up here. <laughs> I got through. <laughs> now this causes terrible consternation in the hallowed halls of evolution, simply because they've got this whole group of people who look just like us. They're older than uh, old Neanderthal and all the rest of the mob that are supposed to have evolved up to us. But they're up right next to us. It's a terrible problem that they came up with. So when in doubt, redate. That's the scientific maxim. So they began by saying it wasn't really that old. And Leakey fought them like a good scientist. And they brought in all the dating processes and everything else. And they found out the cotton picking thing was two, year, two million years old from the rock and everything else. And though they threw in the sponge. Now they say, well, it actually hasn't got the cranial capacity that we have. It's a slight difference here, so we'll rank him as Australopithecus so we can move him back. But the problem is that all of the rest of these monsters down at that level never had tools or pottery. So now the social scientists have jumped on them and are complicating and mucking up the waters by saying, how come this one is more civilized than the ones that he's supposed to be older than. I mean, let's get organized here. And the truth of the matter is they are not organized. So I suggest that you look very long and carefully 
at the infallible argument of the chain of man because that chain was fractured and blasted in 1957 and 1961 and all the king's horses and all the king's men cannot put Cro-Magnon together again. <laughs> then we have the riddle of relativism. These are the people that say you can't have any absolutes. Everything is relativistic. All cultures, all society make things relative. I was uh, appearing on the Long John Neville program one night in New York, and uh, the man I was to appear with was um, an atheist who had a very deep antagonism to Christianity. And when we got on the subject, along with a rabbi and a couple of other people, it got to be a pretty hot program around 2.30 in the morning. And uh, the atheist was Jewish. The rabbi obviously was. The moderator of the program was an agnostic, fallen from grace Lutheran. We had a, a Christian scientist who really didn't know what was going on, <laughs> and uh, myself, and of course I was on the hot seat. They were asking me the questions. Fascinating thing took place at that particular juncture. I was trying to think of some way to get through this relativism, and I was asking the Lord while I was listening to their conversation, now Lord, give me something that's really going to come through so that they get the message long, loud, and clear got to be something good, and I'm not going to talk until I really know that this is something good. So I kept thinking and praying, and they were hammering away on relativistic cultures and all the rest of the rigmarole. And finally, the Lord spoke to my heart and gave me an idea. It was very simple. It was in the form of a swastika. And I said, ah, now that will fit right in here. Of course, they'll be ready to scout me after I use it, but it'll fit right in here beautifully. I said to the a uh, Jewish philosopher and to the rabbi, I said, can I ask you fellas a question? I said, let's just deal with the uh, philosopher. I said, I'll deal with you because you don't believe in God. He said, go ahead. I said, your thesis is that all cultures are relativistic. There no, are no absolutes. That the culture determines morality and truth and right and wrong. And that nobody has any right to interfere with the cultural pattern of a given society. I can't come in and tell the Aborigines to stop headhunting in the name of Jesus because obviously I'm imposing a Christian culture. Right. And I went on and gave him a few other, right, 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 down the line. That's what I'm getting at. No absolutes. I said, all right. I said, now I want you to just listen for five minutes and don't interrupt me. The time is 1938. The place is Nazi Germany. You are a Jewish philosopher teaching at the University of Berlin and I am the head of the Gestapo. I have called you down to headquarters for a little tete a -tete. We are chit-chatting about your future. <laughs> so he looked at me very funny, you know, as if something's coming, but he didn't know quite what. And I said, this is our dialogue. Me speaking. You are a Jew. Jews are a subculture. You betrayed the fatherland in 1918. You have undermined the structure of the Reich. The Fuhrer has decreed that the Jewish problem be committed to us for elimination. And it is necessary, therefore, for me to inform you that you will be taken out tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock to Dachau and there disposed of. What do you say to me? He said, well, this is preposterous. I said, no, it isn't. I said, we're in a historical context, 1938, we're in Berlin, and I said that to you, and it's been said. So it's nothing I invented. What do you say to me? He said, it's, you, you can't kill me. I said, I'm going to shoot you. <laughs> well, you see, all of a sudden, the theoretical disappeared. And it became personal. I really was the head of the Gestapo, and he really was arguing for his life. And he started to argue with me. He said, it's wrong to kill. I said, really? Why? I said, you're in our state. The Fuhrer has decreed that our cultural platform is that the Jews are a race inferior and must be expunged from the face of the earth. It is our cultural imperative that you die. Why shouldn't I kill you? He said, <laughs> He said, I'm not talking about these things. I said, I'm putting your theory into practice. There are no absolutes. You can't tell me I can't kill you because you're in my ballpark 
in my political system and I have the right to kill you as long as you have no higher authority than my culture. <laughs> he looked at me for a long time. He says, oh, he said, I, I, I can't understand why you have to use this illustration. I said, because there are six million people who went through it. And it's people like you with minds like yours that made it possible. And he looked at me for a long moment. He said, what do you mean by that? I said, I'm going to tell you. I said, 15 or 20 minutes ago, you said something I let go by. You said that Christianity had been responsible for the deaths of thousands and thousands and thousands and multiple thousands of human beings in the Inquisition and in all of the pogroms and the things that had gone on through the ages. Religion was responsible for all these things. I said, I never said a word. I said, I did a little survey at our college, however, before I came on this program because I anticipated you might say this. I asked our history department to give me a round figure of how many people died through religious wars and persecutions in recorded history. I said, I have the figure in front of me. I said, it's less than three million people. And he said, what? I said, we'll be glad to document it for you. Less than three million. I said, do you know how many people the philosophies of Friedrich Nietzsche and Karl Marx have killed in 40 years? Fifty-seven million. I said, we are responsible for three million people over all recorded history, or give or take an extra million if you want to add it, you managed in 40 years to wipe out 57 million of them. You Germans followed the philosophy of Nietzsche and every member of the Wehrmacht and the German Air Corps, Luftwaffe, carried with them a copy of Nietzsche's Man and Superman autographed by the Fuhrer. You had to learn it. Believe it and practice it. That's why you murdered the Jews. You bought Nietzsche's philosophy. Two philosophers, when they were carried to their logical conclusion in a relativistic culture where they played by their own ballpark, murdered 57 million human beings. And you have the gall to look at the Church of Jesus Christ and say, we are responsible for the death of people throughout the ages. I said, you haven't got one single argument to give me this moment why as head of the Gestapo I shouldn't shoot you. <laughs> and you know it. He just sat back in his chair and looked at me. We have that on tape. I said, now give me one if you've got one. He said, because it's morally wrong in the context of all humanity. I said, Bushwa. The context of all humanity is kill or be killed, according to you. Now, how are you going to appeal to those cultures, the aborigines that have you for dinner? Somebody else put your head up on a pole. You want to get into your transcultural problem? You've got the problem, not us. Our gospel changes people from headhunters, killers, murderers, thieves, prostitutes, drug addicts, and all the scum of the earth and makes them responsible, respectable, loving, participating members of society. You are parasites. You do nothing but criticize. Why don't you do something for a change? Well, I had a wonderful time after that. <laughs> and I had a chance to preach for maybe a half an hour. The rabbi came in and said, I don't agree with the illustration. I think it's a little too strong. But he says, we simply do have to admit, we do have to admit that the imperative thou shalt not kill does not originate with man. I said, thank you, Rabbi. It originates with God, and that's why as head of the Gestapo, since I'm a good Christian, I won't shoot you. <laughs> Even the Rabbi laughed. <laughs> so I escaped murdering two Jews that night as a Nazi. But you see what I'm talking about now? You've got to reel the tape back into a historical context and force these jokers to live it to its logical conclusion. And when you do, it disintegrates. You can always begin with a trite remark like this. I didn't know that you believed in executing six million Jews. 
<laughs> what do you mean? I never said that. I never. Oh, yes, you did. Oh, no. I, oh, yes, you did. You said that all cultures were relativistic and nobody could change those cultures. Well, then Hitler can't be condemned for murdering the Jews because actually uh, he's the one that set the standard in that culture. What right do you have? Tell him he can't do it. And you're off and running for at least a half hour. <laughs> Finally, we're always accused of circular reasoning. You always quote the Bible, approve the Bible, you Christians. Can we answer this argument? I was debating with a Mormon professor of philosophy from Columbia University, and after about an hour and a half of discussion, he looked across the table at me. We have an audience of approximately 11 to 13 million people in 43 states. When we open up the telephone lines, the computer has clocked as many as 8,000 telephone calls in an hour. So we know they're out there listening. When I debated Madeleine Murray O'Hare the first time for five hours, we clocked more than 7,000 calls in 30 minutes. This gives you a rough idea of how many people were out there trying to get after you and get the answers. How do you answer the circular reasoning fallacy? He looked across at me and he said, you know, part of the problem of Christians, I'm not a Christian, he admitted, is that you persist in circular reasoning. He said, when we ask you for authority to believe in God, you quote the Bible. And then when we ask you for authority to prove that the Bible is reliable, you quote the Bible to support itself. He said, that's circular reasoning. And he said, uh, I don't see why you just don't find a better way of defending your position. Very neat, very sweet, very smiling knife. <laughs> so I was sitting there, and while he was spinning this out, I said to myself, Lord, there's a number of ways I can answer this, I'm sure, but I'll lose the audience. The main thing I want to do is hang on to the audience. I don't care about this joker because he's in here just to fight the gospel. But I've got to get to these people out there. Lord, just give me an answer, please, because I just at this moment don't know what to say. Well, that's a pretty rough feeling to be facing some hostile people, and they're just going to stop in a minute and say, okay, go. And you've got to have an answer. And I was praying. Let me tell you, I was praying. There's always somebody smarter than you are. There's always somebody with more brains than you've got. There's always somebody that can do the job better than you can, no matter who you are. And when you go into any situation, you go in with bowed head and knees, and you depend on the Holy Spirit, and whoever's there is going to get creamed. <laughs> if you go in in your own strength, then you flaunt your brains, your degrees, your diploma, and how your press clippings have piled up, and the Lord's going to see to it you get your skull whacked one of these days. So you go in prayerfully. And I was really praying, Lord, what's the answer? All of a sudden, the Lord gave me the answer, and it was a very strange way. It came in the form of a question. Popped into my mind just like that. Who told them it was one book? And I blinked. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> what a magnificent answer. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> And I looked across at him and I said exactly the same words that the Lord said to me. I said, Dr. Partridge, who told you the Bible was one book? <laughs> he said, well, it is. I said, that's the trouble with you philosophers. You're so wound up in your ivory towers, you've never come down long enough to find out what's going on in the world. And he said, what do you mean? I said, the Bible is not one book. He says, it certainly is. I said, it is not. It's 66. It's a compilation of books spanning a period of 4,000 to 5,000 years, written by men in different time periods, all of whom testify to one singular truth, that they have an experience with a being who describes himself as the eternal God, creator of the universe and savior of mankind. If therefore Isaiah quotes Amos, or Amos quotes Moses, or Moses quotes somebody else, it is not circular reasoning. They lived in different times, and the evidence is valid evidence. The Bible is a compilation of data, therefore they can quote each other, and it is not circular reasoning. And he looked at me for a moment, and I said, now you admit that. He said, I certainly will not. I said, I know you won't, but I just wanted to hear you say it. I said, it's proof positive that you simply will not believe no matter what evidence is produced. I said, now I have refuted circular reasoning logically. 
and you refuse to accept the refutation because it's going to knock your tower of blocks down. I said, well, it's down on the ground scattered all over the place. And I said, we're not guilty of circular reasoning. In fact, I said, we are guilty, if anything, of having the perfect empirical experiment. We have a controlled experiment spanning 5,000 years of people in different times who never knew each other, all telling of the same event. They met an eternal personage who told them that he was the creator of the world, loved them, and was going to send his son to be their savior. That's a controlled experiment. And I said, it's perfectly scientific, and God arranged it as an excellent testimony even to those who don't want to believe it. He just looked at me for a long moment. We had a station break. We went outside for a cup of coffee while they were running commercials. They came up to me and he said, um, where did you get your training? <laughs> and I said, oh, Delphi University and uh, Biblical Seminary and NYU. He says, what did you major in? I said, philosophy. He said, you majored in philosophy? I said, certainly. I said, that's why we ought to come to an agreement right now before we go back on the air. I said, I know all the arguments against my position. I've been through them. I have answers for them and we'll bore the audience stiff. I said, you can't bully me. We have the same educational backgrounds and the same degrees. So now that we have arrived at educational parity, let's go back in and talk like intelligent people and stop trying to trap each other. You're trying to trap me, and you're not going to. I am determined to present Jesus Christ, and I'm going to. <laughs> so let's go in and do it like gentlemen, and if you want to talk philosophy, I said, we are going to have a murderous time. So he said, okay. We went in. He shot off a few wads of philosophy on the subject of why he didn't believe in God. I popped off a few wads of philosophy of why the Christian church did. And then I said, but the really important thing is not philosophical argument. The really important thing is what do we do with the problem of evil in our own lives and how do we go out and change the world and do something about it? The philosophers have never given us a solution. I propose, therefore, that we listen to the supreme philosopher, Jesus Christ. And then I said to Mr. Partridge, I said, I'm sure you will not for a moment compare your philosophical qualifications with his. Dead silence. I said, your ethical and moral standards are not as high as Christ's. Therefore, I suggest that we take him as our point of departure. And with that I began, and nobody interrupted me. I had a good 15 or 20 minute dialogue on Jesus Christ, the supreme philosopher and savior of lost men. God gave the opportunity. What I'm trying to communicate is on the campus, wherever you may be, being able to give to everybody that asks of you an answer, a reason for the hope that lies within you, is not nearly so difficult as it may appear. Once you are willing, to study and show yourself approved by God. Once you are ready and willing to submit your mind and your intellect to the Holy Spirit, once you are ready to recognize that Jesus Christ's gospel really is the power of God unto salvation and that no force in the universe, intellectual or spiritual, can stand against it, you do your homework and God will take care of the salvation of souls. It's been wonderful being with you. I've had a great time. I'd like to go on, but my throat won't go on. And so before I lose it completely, although it's held up marvelously, thank the Lord, I want to take the opportunity to tell you that it's been great talking with you. You are the future of the evangelism of the church. All I can do is give you some of the reasons and urge you to pursue it. The ball is in your hands. By the power of God, you can carry it, and God will bless it. God bless you as you do it.